all those lovely swallows and Amazon books. Sorry, little message. Um, and uh, yeah, so I learned to sail with mum. I was the youngest of four, so I was always uh, um, shoved right at the front out the way and, and so on. Um, but oh, we sailed the Miradingi. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. And we sailed a Miradingi. Mum, that we had a little boat, Mira called Firefly because of the red sail. And um, I sort of, I didn't love it as much as my brothers and sisters did because I was always, you know, the, the, the lowly cabin boy, really. But anyway, um, I then, uh, after I'd done a bit of teaching here in Australia, in Adelaide, I set off over land to see if I could get to England without flying any of the way, which I did. And that, your dad was a teacher, wasn't he? Yes, that's right. Yeah, he 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 was a teacher as well, but not a boat, not a boatman at all. He was so nervous about boats. He grew up in outback Australia, so couldn't even swim. And every time Mum was going out with us four kids, you know, Dad thought, "Well, I'm about to lose the entire family and have to start all over again." Um, but yeah, so I went over and started teaching in this English school called Ellesmere which I've just actually have just completed a third book, which is sort of a memoir of my teaching time there. And then um, the, perhaps it's worth commenting on uh, the, the name Jack de Crow. When I arrived at this college, a very, very lovely Englishy sort of college, very Hogwartsy, you know, quite sort of magical looking. And there were crows everywhere. There were rooks in all the trees and jackdaws in the, nesting in the rooftops and the um the emblem of the school was a raven with a ring in its bill and um the headmaster was called Mr De Crow as well anyway all this combined for me to I just thought oh wouldn't it be brilliant to um have a tame crow I just had this daydream out of nowhere this I, I thought wouldn't it be great to have a tame crow cycle around in my academic cloak looking like a real English schoolmaster and then call out you know and have this crow land on my on my wrist and of course it was just a ridiculous daydream but I even made up a name for this totally imaginary crow I called it Jack Macorber Phallacrocorax Magister Mordecorvus de Crow as a pun on its <laughs> name that's a mouthful for any crow <laughs> absolutely but the extraordinary thing oh, is that a day later I, I told a friend about this this who's, who's an old friend who was a vet and a day later he found a tame slightly injured crow and so my crow <laughs> appeared and I had this ready-made tame crow or a jackdaw actually um which is a type of smallish crow and I called it Jack de Crow and um anyway and that was that was great fun and I had that but then years later six years later when I was deciding to sail away in this little mirror dinghy I wanted to um give it a name and thought oh Jack de Crow is a good name for a for a, a little boat and um and that's how that's how the dinghy got its name from this this uh crow that appeared magically out of nowhere and there's a there's a there's a follow-up story to that but I won't tell it yet I'll, I'll tell it sort of closer to the end because th there are plans afoot and something rather extraordinary happening possibly next year but I'll, I'll perhaps um finish with that later uh, Steve, Steve Williams, do you have a question? Yes, good evening, everyone. I hope you're all well. Um, yeah, I, I typed it in the chat there, but my question uh, was, have you ever had another Jack since your first Jack? Um, yeah, for, since your first crow? Um, as in, have I had another bird or have yes. I had another bird? Yeah, yep. Have you had another one? No, 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 I haven't. Um, the one and only. The, the one and only, absolutely. And look, even though it was it was great fun on paper to have a tame crow, he was a bloody nuisance. I mean, he was, yes. he was shocking. He'd fly around all the place. He'd, he'd steal things. He'd peck, peck people. He'd unstitch the, the, the stitches on a hockey ball in the middle of an important intercollegiate match. Everybody hated him except me. And the laundry ladies and Mr. and Mrs. De Crow, who were saintly people who um, who were great fans. But apart from that, no, he was a jolly nuisance. So they are they are incredibly intelligent. I uh, I equal them to the octopus because they um, there's YouTube videos of crows actually. Um, they put uh, there's a lady 
who keeps putting uh, food into a jar and then yep. making and then trying to and then filming the crows figuring out how to get the food out of the jar oh. and they'll use sticks and they'll they'll fill the jar up with stones and they'll do all different things to to be able yep. to get, to get the food they're quite incredible they are aren't they astonishing in fact i remember there's an aesop's fable going you know back 2000 years about the crow that was trying to get water out of a jug a, a, a clay pitcher um mm -hmm. jar and dropped stones in until the water level rose and that sounds like just a, a fable but um uh it i think it's probably true or based on real observation and just one other question before others yeah. ask theirs um where else have you taught since because i'm i'm actually a teacher here in australia myself i teach uh, at toronto oh right um well i so yes taught there in ellesmere Mm -hmm. Then after the journey, I went to Argentina and taught in Argentina for two years in a, in a school in Buenos Aires, um, which was great. That was that was a really lovely, lovely experience. Fantastic students. Uh, and then I answered an ad for Geelong Grammar down in Carrillo, south of Melbourne. Um, and I got uh, I worked there for four years, but then. At the end of that time, I actually moved up to the Timbertop campus, which is the fantastic Year Nine campus um, up in the uh, the Victorian High Country, and I've been there now so, since two thousand five. So what's that? Seventeen years. So uh, um, uh, that's been lovely. Yeah. Oh, and I taught. I taught. I took a little time off and taught in a local Steiner school as well, which was beautiful. I, I love the Steiner education. Well, the uh, the planet sort of aligned because I was actually reading your book or listening to your book through Audible for the last sort of week. Oh, right. And I, and I finished it yesterday, yesterday morning. And I said to my wife, oh, there's actually an interview with this with this author um, tomorrow night. So I need to finish this book before the interview. And um, and then yesterday, the, the weather was perfect to go for a sail. So I went for a sail out on Lake Macquarie. And I said right. to her before I left, um, rest assured, I will come back. So I'm not I'm not going to sail to the end of the year. I haven't been that inspired. Oh golly! Oh, that's very kind, Steve. Thank you. Um, yes, and and um, actually, the whole if anybody's interested, the the timber top where I work is actually on S um, SBS tonight at eight o'clock. There's a fantastic documentary where I, I I feature a little bit in it, but about Indigenous three Indigenous students, um, one of whom was in my house, I was his house master. Um, and it's it's a fantastic documentary. So that's on SBS eight tonight. I think it's a three part, three parter. Wonderful. Um, well, well worth watching. Right, thank uh, you. We've got a question next. Uh, Holly Puckering. Hi, hello everyone. It's actually just something that my son, Jean wanted to say. Oh, hello, Jean. Hi, hello, Holly. Hello. Hello. Do you want to say? Yeah. Um, so how did you actually get through the massive area that you've covered and um, Jack de Crone also? Is she still alive? Ah, right. Well, two, two questions there. First of all, um, how did I cover the area? Well, I just, it's a bit like walking. I, I'm always astonished. You, you put one foot in front of another. And you just keep doing that and suddenly you've walked 100 miles or 20 miles or whatever um i just kept rowing around the next bend and then thought oh what's around the next bend and oh what's around the next bend and then you know oh there's a bit of wind well let's see how far i can sail and oh my goodness the river's widening out and oh goodness we've come to the sea oh well let's see what happens so you just keep doing that long enough and it's astonishing what distances you can cover. Um, so yeah, so that, that 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 that's and and in fact, I think that's how most things happen in life. You know, you nothing ever happens in big leaps. It only ever happens one day at a time, one step at a time. Um, uh, and the trick is just keep going and don't don't try and swallow too many. Don't bite off it or don't think it's a huge mouthful to chew. It's just. One little nibble, one little nibble, another little nibble, and suddenly you've uh, you've you've had a feast. Um, now, as for as for it's it's terribly um, 
confusing. People ask, is Jack de Crow, you know, what is happening to Jack de Crow? Do they mean the bird or the boat? So are you asking, is the boat still extant or yes. is the bird? Uh, probably ah. boat. Right. Um, no idea about the bird. Uh, Jack de Crow, the bird, flew away one day and um, uh, that? but yeah. I kept hearing I kept hearing lovely stories from the laundry ladies at, at the college I was working who'd say, oh, we saw Jack down at Tetchell. He was sort of playing with the children in Tetchell Primary. And, oh, we, we saw him in the, in the car park of the Three Pigeons, you know, the pub. So I'd like to think he's still somewhere out there, thieving and being a mischief maker. Now, the boat, I, this all sorts of, sort of comes to the story that I want to tell right at the end of this whole sort of interview, but I'll, I'll start telling it. I left the boat at Sulina on the Black Sea in Romania, and I left it with the harbour master. And to be honest, by that stage, I just wanted to walk away. I was, you know, fed up of traveling. I had had my feast, um, no more little nibbles. And um, for years and years, I've wondered, oh, I wonder if it's still there. Well, fairly recently, I taught with a lovely, lovely Romanian fella called um, Ozzy Otto, big, big, very sort of uh, large, beer drinking, boar eating Romanian man. Big, great, fun, <laughs> lovely, lovely man. Um, he looks like Obelix, o Obelix out of the Asterix comics. I don't know if you know those, those Asterix comics. He's no, I don't. Really big Romanian man. And he, he taught with me at the school I've been, I, I teach at, but he recently he went back to Romania. And I said, Ozzy, can you do me a favor? Can you go and find out for me whether the Jack de Crow, the boat is still there in the, in the harbor? Well, he did his best. He wrote to the harbor master, et cetera, et cetera. And he, he texted me about four weeks ago to go, no, I'm sorry, not, no, not there. I probably just rotted away to nothing, which is not surprising because it's 25 years, 25 years, a little wooden dinghy. It was in appalling shape by the time I got it there. And so the answer is, I think, no more original Jack de Crow. But there is a big however to that, which I might answer later because I want to finish it with it. Good question. Thank you, Thank you Jean. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to say one more thing? Um, what? You were saying you wanted to say thank you. Oh, yeah. Just, yeah, thanks for the book and stuff. Even though I haven't finished, haven't finished oh. it yet. Yeah. But you're so inspired. And so for the last few years, jean has been working towards cruising. And today he went on his first proper dinghy cruise. Yeah, we um, circumnavigated uh, three oh, islands. Three islands today. New Zealand? Tasmania? No, Tasmania. Tasmania. Hope <laughs> Island. Um, what are the others? Faith and Charity? Yeah. Yeah. Where, where the, are they? Down in the deep south in Dover. Dover. Now, hang on. Which, which, which part of um, Australia are we? Tasmania, at the very bottom of the Ancastro Channel, down opposite ah. Bruny Island. So quite remote wilderness. Oh. Yeah. Wow, but fantastic. And were you in a, a well done, were you in a dinghy or a a, um, a, a bigger boat? Yeah, we were wow. in a dinghy. I've got a, a very dear friend, a, a what, sorry? Um, a Springbank 15. Oh, fantastic. I know, I know that part because I've a very dear friends um, grew up on Bruny Island and her parents still live there. Um, and uh, wow, gosh. In winter, though, those could be heavy seas. They're really not. They're flat. <laughs> They're really flat, unless it's a gigantic swell coming off the island. You had a good time. And he was very inspired by you. So thank you for the opportunity to talk to you tonight. Amazing. Yeah. My pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely. Love to just speak to you. Good Thanks. on you. Yeah. And can I just say, Holly, before you disappear, Shame on you for not introducing the kids to Asterix and Obelix. <laughs> if you I haven't read Asterix, I can, you must. I can lead a horse to water, but I can't make them drink. <laughs> Tell them it's cartoons and comics. It's just like mm. TV, but flat in two dimensions. <laughs> Indeed. Locker up on Asterix. It's fabulous stuff, Jean. You really ought to read it. Really fun. You love them. Yeah. Well, really I do like comics. Yeah, and they're funny ones. Yeah. 
all of that magic okay, potions and galls and strange yes. happenings. And don't forget the pirates. Yeah. That's right. You, you'll read one and you'll remember me saying, don't forget the pirates. Enjoy. Fantastic. All right. Uh, Chris Curtis, you have the next question? Hi. I was wondering if you'd have any comments on the suitability of a mirror if one was contemplating a similar trip. Um, is there a better boat to choose or would a, a more suitable boat make it less of an adventure? <laughs> oh, look, to be honest, I'm not a great expert in other sorts of boats. So I think the mirror is perfect. Um, the reason I chose a mirror, well, partly because I'd grown up sailing one, but the reason I did was because on the canals and the rivers, they all, there are bridges a bit every Every 500 meters, you're going under a very low bridge. And so I needed it. I couldn't possibly have something like a, a laser or whatever. I, I needed something where the mast could come down or if the bridge was a bit high, you could lower the gaff. Um, so that was the main reason I chose it. And also it's, it's fairly unusual to find a, a dinghy, a sailing dinghy that you can row. Um, you need to be able to row. So, yeah, and they're so comfortable. I think mirrors are are absolutely perfect. They're like sailing an armchair, really. Um, and they're not the fastest, but there was something about it. The fact that it was wooden meant that when things broke, even I, and I'm incompetent and hopeless, even I could mend things, screw things in, bash things in, glue things. Um, whereas a, you know, a, a fiberglass boat, I, I wouldn't have a clue. If I'd put a hole in a fiberglass boat, I'd have, you know, I'd have, thrown up my hands in despair. So there was something, there was something very um, manageable about a mirror. Um, but also, of course, yes, it was a great adventure. And there's something rather nice to have said I went all that way in a in a little toy wooden boat. Yeah. Thank you. I, are you contemplating an adventure? Uh I dream, but I think I'd probably get killed if I did. But I, I sometimes <laughs> oh. wonder, I, I'm just outside Canberra, and if we've oh, got okay. a creek called Brooks Creek that runs on the boundary of our property, and if you go in Brooks Creek, you can follow that down to the Yass River, which runs into the Murrumbidgee and then the Murray, and then you can head up to Darling and you can get to nice warm weather in Queensland eventually. Ah, uh, yes, if you turned and went upstream in the Darling. Yes. Oh, well, that's a big, powerful motor if you're going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> that's cheating. That's cheating. Yeah. Gosh. Oh, well, good luck. I just... Off you go. Do it. <laughs> right, you, have you have your orders, Chris? Yeah. I'll, I'll report back next year. <laughs> we hope. Um, <laughs> Dave Carlson, you're next. Thanks very much, Kim. Um, Sandy, so you started in, in Jack the Crow, not started, but your adventures were in Jack the Crow. Have you, what other sort of vessels have you sailed since then? And, and what do you sail when you go to Jindabyne these days? Oh, look, um, so yes, the main sailing I did when I was taught down at Geelong Grammar, the main campus at Geelong Grammar, we sailed paces, um, mirrors as well. Uh, um, we had a lovely cooter boat. Do you know? I'm not sure if people are familiar with a cooter boat. It's um, mm. it was lent to the school by the Meyer family, which was nice. And um, yeah, that was that was love, lovely to sail. And then my mother at the she was still sailing at the age of eighty um, because she'd got herself a little dinghy called a. I don't know, it was for disabled. I mean, it was it was designed for disabled people and I knew Answer. Can't. Say it again? Answer. No, it wasn't. Um anyway, it was it look, it was a it was a lovely little dinghy and you could sit access. right down in the access, access. That's it. An access dinghy. I just so <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, so um I used to go and sail that, and we've still got a La not a laser but a spiral which is very like a laser we've still got a spiral which we take out in summer and sail around um but that, yeah that's that's about it thanks very much that's all right 
Okay, uh, is that is, uh, Ben Tucker, you're next. Uh, remember to unmute Ben. Alt A, Ben. Uh, hello, Sandy. Sorry about that. I um no I problem. just wondered in, when you um went down the um European canals, what sort of proportion of sailing did you manage to get versus rowing? Were you rowing most of the way, or did you get a bit of sailing in? Oh, look, uh, on the canals, mostly rowing, um, because yeah, the the wind well, they're they're fairly narrow. I just yeah mostly rowing i there, there were some very memorable moments when i sailed um i could only ever sail if the wind was coming straight behind me well no actually uh, sorry on the canals and rivers the wind is either coming straight on the nose or straight behind um now the canals are so narrow that when it was on the nose there was no 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 point in tacking um when the wind was behind me that was good. I could just put up the sail and just sort of um, run downwind. Um, and that was that was exciting and lovely, but it especially became exciting when I was going along a canal and suddenly, without realising it, I was on an aqueduct that was right across this great big valley, this huge, huge aqueduct. And suddenly the wind picked up enormously in fact it was no longer coming straight behind me it was coming straight down the valley sort of across and I was hurtling along that very narrow aqueduct um which had no railings or anything of either at either side so you were literally looking out of the out of the dinghy and looking at a 100 meter drop to the valley below uh and Can't get up and and the wind pelting me across that aqueduct and me nearly flipping over the edge so um yeah that that was that was sailing but i was quite happy to get back to the rowing after that mm, a bit and i got very fit i'm I've, I've lost it all now but um all the rowing my god i got halfway across germany and looked like a greek god which was the first time in my life that that, that first and last time that that's ever happened Thanks, Sandy. That makes that makes the achievement covering all those miles even more impressive. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. It was fantastic. I loved doing it. Uh, um, Meredith, what, what's okay. a, oh, sorry. So, I was just going to say, look, once I got to the rivers, um, rivers were much easier. As soon as they were broader, I was able to mostly sail, which was fantastic. Really lovely. All right, uh, Meredith, your turn. Hello. <laughs> reading, reading the comment by Peter Ironmonger. Yes, I think you're right. <laughs> All right, where am I? Where am I? I've moved. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. You can see me? Yeah, sorry. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, Sandy, uh, lovely, lovely to hear from you. Um, uh, I read okay. your book quite a long time ago. It must have been shortly after it came out, and I, so it's a bit of a dim recollection. But but I just started rereading it um, a couple of days ago when I saw Kim's um, uh, post. Um, right. And I, I, it's a wonderful piece of writing. And I, I just wanted to ask you about the writing. So yeah. when you were writing, did you keep notes or did you um, keep a diary or how, how did you put the book together? Oh, good question. Um, yeah, so look, two, two things. First of all, whenever I've been off on big, long travel, I've always written letters, um, letters home to family and also to a very, very dear friend uh, called Chris. Um, and that's a fantastic thing to do. And of course, nowadays, you with email and so on, I'd probably not do it. You know, if I was setting off tomorrow, it's so easy to email. But back in those days, it was literally letters and post restaurant and all that sort of thing. But I, yeah, so I, I, I wrote very, very detailed, extensive letters. And the good thing about that, rather than keeping a diary, is that you're, you're, um, 
you're writing for an audience and so therefore you know you're trying to make it entertaining and you're exaggerating a little bit here and making a funny story and trying to um capture a description or you know um uh, uh, you know capture a place in in good language and so most of the book was based on those letters which were were kept and given back to me but then i i was given a little um, journal by the very first person I met in France, this lovely family who gave me a little red leather back um, journal. And I kept that pretty well every day. And that was for, sort of for the, um, oh, the details, you know, how many kilometers I'd gone, which towns I'd gone through, wildlife that I'd seen along the way, birds and plants. Um, so I had that as well. And basically when it came to writing it, I had all my letters, and then my little red red diary, which gave the hard facts and, and about mileage and routes and so on and so on. Um, but yeah, I've always I've always enjoyed letter writing, and uh, and I I would always recommend if people are um, going off travelling that they rather than keep a journal that they write letters to somebody because it forces you to write for an audience. Mm. Hmm. Do you do you write yourself? Uh, well, yes, I, I, I suppose I do tend to try and keep a, a journal. Um, and I have, you know, written a few articles and things like that over the years, but not it's something that I've, I've always wanted to do, but I, uh, you know, work gets in the way sort of thing. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> as oh, for a lot of people, yes. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it does indeed. It does. Mm. Yes, um, I've just I've just finished a literally sent off to the publishers yesterday my third book. So um, um, that, that's a, a type of Ellesmere a memoir of teaching, basically, and that's been fun, fun writing. Um, but yes, it's 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 sort of hard work. Well, no, it's not really. I mean, I love it. As soon as I actually sit down and start writing, I write very fluently, very very quickly and get totally absorbed in it and it's not a chore at all but the sitting down is the really hard bit you know it's for some reason you procrastinate and you put it off and you think it's going to be hard and you think it's going to be a chore and so it's just making yourself sit down and do it is the hard bit isn't it mm. yeah yes it's like the the sitting out on the journey it's the first step that's the hardest. Yes, absolutely. Once you make the first step, the second one naturally follows. Yeah, that's right. Before and, you know and where you are, you're halfway to Timbuktu. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I always loved that. Um, the you know I love Tolkien, of course, um, Lord of the Rings, and that that um, quote from Gandalf is so apposite. You know, you be careful about putting your foot out on the road because you'll never know where you'll end up you know this road going past your front door is the same the road that back goes... again. <laughs> yeah exactly that's right and it's the same road that goes right past the lonely mountain and uh and dragons and, and so on and it's very true it's very true hmm. right. that uh, famous poem about the road less traveled was that keats no robert frost Robert Frost. 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 Yes, two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveller. Long I stood, blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I, I still know. teach it. <laughs> yeah, I, I know it off by heart. I still teach it to my students. It's it's all about the psychology of choice. Yes, precisely. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. This is uh, lovely. This is so much fun. David Pello, I think you're next. Yeah, um, I just um asking, I read your uh, book. Um, and the, um, the, the uh, before you left Britain, I think that you lost your jib, so your foresail. And yes. did you ever replace that, or how did that? How what was? How did you lose it? And um, did that mean you went all the way through Europe with just your mainsail? I did. I did. Look, um, one of the problems of of doing interviews like this is that I can't disguise the fact that. When it comes to sailing, I'm an absolute fraud, a complete amateur. Um, my brother, if he were doing it, if he were listening to this, he'd be going, oh, for God's sake, Sandy, you could have done this, you should have done that. Look, I I tried using the jib on a number of occasions coming down on the canals and just found that, to be honest, the wind was 
always uh, well either on the nose where I, I I couldn't the canals were too narrow as I've said before or right behind me in which case I didn't need a jib and I found just trying to operate a jib and a mainsail was was really quite difficult you know there were times when the 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 jib was doing things that nearly drowned me you know the bloody thing would get tangled around a tree or or something or get jammed so I wasn't actually using the jib much then it was stolen I think it, I mean I, I left it in the dinghy at Sharpness Sheerness was muddled those Sheerness um and it was gone the next morning and I went oh thank god good riddance and so I did the whole rest of the journey without it and to be honest never really missed it because um as I say really most of the sailing was done with the wind straight behind me and um it was only a couple of times when I was tacking where it would have been very very useful and I instead I used the oars to sort of drag me around and that was a that was a bit of um comic slapstick at its best you probably classify yourself more as an accidental sailor yeah very <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Yes, I always, I always approach everything in life. Oh, how hard can it be? And then discover the hard way. You know how hard it is. But I always, I'm a, I'm a great optimist. So I always just go, oh, surely, surely, just how hard could this be? Mm. And then, and then we find out. But um, yeah, I thought most of this <laughs> was sailors waiting for an accident. Uh. Yes, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, it is uh, interesting in this group, a lot of the conversations are about equipment and precautions and all that sort of stuff. And um, I guess you've sort of shown that maybe that's not, not the most important thing. <laughs> oh, no, for me, it was never the important thing. I mean, it should have been, but um, yes, all that was just the, the faff and they were, you know, it was the people met along the way or the wildlife and the beautiful sunsets or the, ah, just, just the rivers themselves and the landscape themselves were the thing that, that got me terribly interested. And I do, I do have a number of people who write to me and ask me, you know, so did you, how did you, you know, rig the lazy jacks with the topping lift um, and uh, along with a tiller tamer and what sort of ply rope did you use? Oh, oh. And you politely respond. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I saw a red diver, if that helps. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, no, complete fraud, really. Right, uh, Steve Williams, your next oh, question to the, to the fraud. Um, yeah, so my first part is a is a comment, and and when I was listening to your book, I I, I was just blown away with the kindness of people, and I and I loved that that was just like an overarching theme, right across mm. um, strange countries with strangers meeting this uh, very strange man in a pith helmet, you know, playing his tin whistle, yes. and you seem to have been able to. Um, bring out, I guess, the uh, so much kindness. And there was only a couple of stories of people, you know, either stealing something or uh, or causing some concern with your safety. So I just wanted to point out that throughout your book, I thought that was uh, fantastic. And my, my question um, is, can you sort of illuminate us a little on the <clears throat> what... Meredith's question was about your writing and, and I wanted to sort of expand on that a little bit too and ask you from from your journey you know obviously you didn't do your journey in in order to write a book you did a journey to yeah. get from A to B and to explore the world and and its wonders and then of course the book came afterwards what what happened between mm -hmm. the end of the journey I know that's a very big gap of time but can you sort of give us a, a bit of a snapshot on what what turn of events said all right well i need to put pen to paper and, and share this uh this story with uh with readers as an author not a sailor yes yeah no um good question so look after i'd finished the journey i, I went off for two years and taught in argentina um which was wonderful i lo loved that um but during that two years there i i was not speaking um, Spanish. <laughs> so I had a lot of time on my own in the evenings. Um, 
and thrown on my own resources a bit. And I st I've always, look, I've always loved writing. I'm an English teacher. I've always loved books. I always fancied myself as, a, as an author of something. And it suddenly struck me that, gosh, I, I, I've probably got a story to tell. And so started started writing it out. I didn't know how to type back then. So I started writing it out by hand. And then I'd come home for the holidays back to Australia and here to Jindabyne. And my saintly mum would sit upstairs typing the whole thing out while I was handling Because she was a typist and could do it. <laughs> yes, she was the typist. But then we'd keep meeting at sort of meal times, and she'd say, oh, Sandy, now I've chopped all that bit out about Shrewsbury <laughs> because I don't think Great Aunt Mary would like it, you know, because I'd, <laughs> I'd made some disparaging comments about this town, you know, having been <coughs> overrun by yobbos. And and my mother would um, sort of say, no, so I I just left all that bit out. <laughs> I go, well, please don't. So I thought, well, I better learn to type myself. Yeah, and put then those bits back in. Just, yeah, that's right. That's right. And the editor later took them all out anyway. But um, but it, and again, I you know I really didn't type. It was two finger typing, and it's amazing once you've once you've written a book that way, you you can then type. So um, and it's a good thing I did. Um, but yeah, no, I lo look, I love writing, and I, I I I do a fair bit of writing short stories or poetry or plays. I've written a number of plays and so on. Um, uh, so it was only understandable that uh, uh, the adventures of uh, the dinghy adventures were going to find themselves in writing. Well, Does that answer the question? A follow up question yes. for that, Sandy. In in light yeah. of what you've just said about um, you've written a few plays, have yeah. you, in, in light, I mean, I don't know if you're aware that Swallows and Amazons has been written as a play? No, no. I knew it was a film. It's been made into several films. It has also but, been um, rewritten and, and for the stage. And apparently, I haven't really? seen the production, but it's quite good. So you might want to investigate that because I definitely think there's room for a Unreliable Adventures of Jack De Crow stage play. <laughs> it's there's a thought for you. <laughs> I can't even movie. imagine it's... Swallows and Amazons as a stage play because so oh, yeah, much definitely. of Swallows and Amazons is... Yeah. Is about mm. I don't know I suppose with all clever miming you could get all the boats and the the they 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 they, they, they did a lot of um in in the from the props department the boat was basically a, a curve that simulated the prow and and a little bit of the the gunnel at the bow and 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 Roger the boy boy had to sail that across the stage and stuff like that wow. there was a lot of there was a lot of props to make it happen what a lovely Charming idea because they yeah, are homework. Books. They're just homework. Homework. Yes. <laughs> homework, <laughs> Mr. McKinnon. Homework. <laughs> <laughs> I'm onto it. I'm onto it. Hey, uh, David Pillow, yeah. you're next. Yeah. Um, just um, I remember when reading the book, you uh, ate a lot of tomato sandwiches and uh, stuff like that. Yes. Um, I was just wondering what sleeping arrangements and um when you uh did you have much in the way of did you have a stove or any uh, what sort of sort of living equipment did you have on the boat yeah so um look very very little partly because because i was on rivers and canals the whole way i was almost never out of reach of a village or a little settlement somewhere um once I got down into the wilder parts of Romania, there were times when I was, you know, a long way away from restaurants, pubs, cafes, villages. Um, so I didn't actually take a stove. I, I, I should have, in a way, I would have saved a bit, bit of money. I think in the whole trip, only on one occasion, I lit a little fire on the bank and cooked, cooked myself some cheese and um, cheese toast or something which was on a fire. Um, but in terms of sleeping, I rigged the boat up to sleep on under a little awning and I unrolled a little mattress. I'd made some planks that sort of sat uh, in the bilges by day and then across the boat at night to make a sort of sleeping platform. And a little awning that draped over the boom, uh, which acted as a ridge pole and, and then hooked on down the side. 
But I'm, I'm going to tell you, because it's one of my favourite stories, I've told it on radio, but I hope people won't mind me telling, <laughs> telling this. One of my favourite stories is, um, I, as I say, I had this little mattress that I'd unroll at night. And one night in France, you see, I, I learned French at school, but it was very, very much schoolboy French. I mean, I, you know, I could ask, um, I could say things like the pen of my uncle is smaller than the garden of my aunt, but nothing much more. Je ne parle pas français, mais un tout petit peu. Oui, 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 un petit peu, petit, petit peu. Petit peu. But um, one night I was just setting up my boat for the night and a Frenchman came down, as so often happened, kind people came down and he stood there and, oh, yeah, ce n'est pas possible. Dormir ici, you cannot sleep here, it's not possible. And I, in my best schoolboy French, said, oh, non, non, monsieur. Non, à nuit, at night, je suis très confortable. I am very comfortable. Parce que, because, um, j'ai une petite maîtresse. I was trying to say I have a little mattress. Ah. And, and he looked, he looked, oh, 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 oh. because what I'd actually said, of course, was at night I am very comfortable because I have a little mistress, <laughs> because maîtresse is mistress in French. And um, and being French, he sort of understood that perfectly and went, ooh la la. <laughs> um, yeah, oh, yeah. But anyway, that he did later, he very kindly, he and his wife invited me back for dinner and so on, um, as, as so often happened. And the next morning he came to see me off and he said, oh, monsieur, um, the word for this thing is uh, um, matala, matala, non maîtresse, non, 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 matala. Oh, I must remember that. But about two weeks later, I was in the, exactly the same same situation. Another Frenchman came down and said, Oh, no, no, ce n'est pas possible. He's dormi ici. No, 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 no. And I said, Oh, no, no. Remember the word. Not maîtresse. Uh, à nuit, je suis très confortable parce que, uh, because j'ai, uh, I have un petit matelot. I said matelot this time instead of matelot. And matelot means a little sailor boy. So, um, yes, so, you know, that's what made me comfortable. So, uh, oh, yeah, oh. and, oh, oh. <laughs> so after that, I don't know. <laughs> 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 um, but no, the French are very, very um, liberal in these things. Right. So it was great. So you went across Europe with um, without coffee and tea. Well, not yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, apart from what I could buy in a in a local little tavern or cafe or whatever. So, um, if I ever did it again, I I take a little stove. I, I work at a place called Timbertop now, which does lots and lots and lots of hiking. So I have I have fantastic camping equipment, and I've got a stove that's about you know. Um, but I'm, I even 20, 25 years ago, the, the camping gear wasn't that great. Like, you, Trangia was around, no, it exactly. much else. Hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Little, little MSR um, stoves and all that sort of stuff. No, that's right. And um, to be honest, on the, on the mirror dinghy, there was very, very little room. You know, I could barely fit what I had. So um, even taking a stove along would have been, I would have been hard put to... Uh, um, uh, store it anywhere. I don't know. Uh, Carson, no, I've got an Australian question for you. Where'd you put the beer? Oh, <laughs> well, there's always room for beer. You go on a trip like that without somewhere to keep the beer cold. <laughs> well, exactly. There's always room just for a few little bottles just lying in the lying in the bilges. I'm hoping I don't capsize. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it was. It was nice to have a have a little glass of beer at the end of the day with my tomato sandwich and tomato and salami. I, I certainly ate far, far less then than I do now. Um, and it was something rather nice about just everything, everything down to being very frugal and mm. and then you'd enjoy it so much more. My God, a, a, you know, a, a, a little hunk of bread with two slices of salami and half a tomato. Oh, was fantastic. there an element, Sandy? Do you think, in in looking back in hindsight, was there an element of of, of the pilgrimage or, or the, the the hermitage kind of aspect to your solo travels? I mean, did it did it provide you with that 
kind of atmosphere and the opportunity for deep reflection? Yeah, look, it, it turned into that. It certainly did. Halfway through Europe, it did. I mean, I, I remember vividly realising that actually the whole thing was a bit of a holiday. You know, I was staying in, I, I, despite the fact that I had the boat set up for sleeping on, I, I quite often would treat myself to staying in a guest house, guest house or whatever. Um, and then I remember going, no, come on, Sandy, you've got to do this properly. You're going to cater for yourself. You're going to just buy buy some groceries, and um, and on the day I decided that, it then just poured with rain for about two weeks solid. <laughs> God is taking me very seriously. You know, I've decided to. And you weren't even in an Ireland. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, decided to be the hermit and 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 frugal living and and even the the fine sunshine was taken away from me um but yeah it was very good for me and I, I learned it, it struck me and this is a bit sententious but it struck me that in our daily life look we we eat before we ever get hungry we drink before we ever get thirsty we um we treat ourselves before we're ever or, or we you know we entertain ourselves before we're thoroughly bored mm. and that I did go through a period for the, especially about the last five months, where I was actually getting really hungry and then eating and getting really thirsty and then drinking and so on and so on. Um, and it struck me as a very good way of doing things, really. It sharpens everything up and you realise, you realise just how wonderful food is or wonderful a glass of water is or even more you know a, a, a glass of beer when you haven't just had three a night for the last month um when it's a treat but i mean that that's a fairly obvious thing to say but it was certainly true okay um so any questions people haven't spoken yet so everyone had their chance while you're while you're talking of um, getting drink, I'm just going to grab another glass of wine. Hang on. <laughs> Very important. Grab another glass of wine. Yeah. So just remember, if you want to have a question, raise your hand. If you don't there have to raise your hand, so, so, we'll see. Those days of frugality are well <laughs> beyond me. <laughs> well behind me. <laughs> it's one of those things you do once and look back on it with fondness, but no desire to rep for repetition. Yeah. Uh, so, Sandy, um, we yes. had a poll um, yeah. in our group last week, actually, for favourite mm. sailing-related poem. So, wondering if you actually had a had a choice there. Oh. Mm. Um. <laughs> gosh. Oh well, of course, there is um John Macefield. You know, when I uh, down to the sea and ships. Um. Oh no, no. Um. Cargos. Cargos. Um. Mm. Um. Stately Spanish galleon. Sailing from the isthmus, dipping through the tropic by the palm green shores with a cargo of something, and doubloons, something and something and gold madores and so on. Um, Quinquereen from Nineveh, from distant, rowing home to Haven in sunny Palestine with a cargo of ivory, apes and peacocks, seedwood and sandalwood and sweet white wine. Um, and then there's the one about the the, the there's the British um, tugboat or British steamboat. steamboat. Um, yeah, I think that would be one of my favourites. Uh, what What were some of the other suggestions? Um, so John Maysfield was the, the top one. Um, actually, yep. this here. Let's see what the poll says. Sorry, let's go pull it up. That's right. Yeah, we have sort of weekly polls on, on different topics to get the, the group motivated. Um, so Sea Fever by John Maystill was the winner. Oh, well. yes. I shall go down to the sea again, the lonely sea of the sky. Um, on the good ship Venus was the second one, which was then censored, so we're not going to talk about that one. <laughs> um, the Rhyme of the Ancient oh, Mariner, yes. um, Coleridge was... Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, out on the Pussycat, Edward Lear, 
Cosmo oh, Bar, okay. Tennyson. Ah, um, oh, exquisite. I kept my captain by Mark Walker. Actually, was his that was his nomination there? Walt Whitman. Yeah. Oh, you sorry yep. about um, Hard as the Journey, Lee Bai, uh, Ulysses, Tennyson, uh, The Odyssey. Yes. Uh, uh, on the beach at night alone, Walt Whitman. And, yes, beautiful. Um, yeah, going through down for the for the most other things. Hmm. How lovely. I yes. Um, yeah, oh, all all fantastic. Um, I I was in touch with a man in America who runs a mirror mirror dinghy um, uh, cruising club, and he kindly asked me to be honorary president. So I am honorary president of some some mirror club that I've never visited in America, oh, and okay. uh, he asked me to write a write a poem um, <laughs> for the for the club, which I did, and I. I think it was way too long and uh, and um, fiddly, um, but yeah. So I wrote a I wrote a poem about Miradingi cruising. But I, um, if your members are interested, I could post it. I don't think I have it with me now, but um, uh, I think he wanted something snappier. But, but <laughs> I don't do snappy, <laughs> as my as my editor would would tell you. I don't do snappy. I need everything. I give him, he then has to sort of reduce down and boil down. And there's an awful lot of trimming. Of, that's what it is for. Yeah, that's right. Your job. It's, it's in the job description, you know, edit. Yeah, it certainly is, it certainly is. Okay. Um, does anyone else have a question? Uh, can I just quickly ask your, um, your other books or the second book that comes after this one? I haven't even, I don't even know the title of it. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your, um, your follow-up um, uh, works? Yeah, so um, look, it's called The Well at the World's End. And when, so I, I taught for my first six years of teaching in Australia, at the end of that time, I wanted to go to England. My mother's English. I'd lived in England as a little boy. I'd always wanted to go and do a stint of teaching in England. But I decided that I wanted to get there without flying any of the way. Um, I, again, just th this was before Jack to Crow. This was when I was sort of 28. And I was desperate to go and have a real sort of adventure. And I, I thought, you know, if you just get on a plane, you, you, you miss all the adventure. And so I'd, I had actually lined up holiday in New Zealand, but then I decided from New Zealand, I'm gonna see if I can get all the way to the island of Iona in Scotland without flying any of the way. And it's all to do with the fact there's a, there's a, a well of eternal youth on Iona, which I'd visited when I was 19. Um, and there's a whole story there about how I'd, I'd drunk from it. No, I'd bathed in it um to get eternal youth and only later discovered you're meant to drink from the damn thing and <laughs> and in in this old book it said pilgrims must come by land or by sea to drink from the um waters of the well so using that as an excuse i went all right i'm i mucked it up first time i'm gonna bloody well do it properly this time i'm gonna get from by land and by sea to this well and that was my excuse so basically I did, I spent an entire year um, traveling overland, not flying any of the way. I was yachting a fair bit, you know, crewing on yachts, a um, lot of other land travel. And I finally got to Scotland. So that also, I wrote a book, um, again, from letters that I'd written to people back home, but I sort of turned the whole thing into a book. So that's called The Well at the World's End. Um, and that's my second second book. It's a very good read too. Oh, oh thank, thank you. you, thank you. I'll check it Thanks. out. Thank you very much. Oh, my my pleasure. So, and look, it's interesting. I I get about 50 50 so, uh, people who contact me. About fifty percent say, "Oh, I love Jack to Crow," and "Well at the World's End," not so much. And the other the other fifty percent go, "Oh, um, loved Well at the World's End even more." So. I'm actually really relieved about that because I'd hate to write a book that was a complete dud. You know, I don't want to be the, I don't want to write that book that everybody says, eh, yeah, not so good. Well, <laughs> so. I, just, I just picked up um, Peter Fitzgibbon's The Incredible Life of Hubert Wilkins. 
And um, I'm absolutely right. blown away that um, I've never, like I'm a geographer, I teach geography, history and drama. Hmm. And I've never heard of this guy. And apparently um, every Australian should should know about him. And I, I've just been doing some research the last 24 hours. And it's such an incredible story. So I'm really looking forward to, to listening to this one. Can you, sorry, can you tell me the title again? The Incredible Life of Hubert Wilkins by Peter Fitz, Fitzgibbon. Right. Fitzgibbons. And he's right. a South Australian, Gosh. he's a South Australian boy. And um, his story is actually intermeshed in um, so many other people's lives. Um, and, you know, around the turn of the century. Wasn't he an so, inventor or something? I beg your pardon? Wasn't he an inventor or something? No, he was, he was an adventurer. Um, and uh -huh. he was all about climate change, um, but around the 19, 1906 uh -huh. onwards. And um, yeah. he lived on the edge of the Simpson Desert and they went through that 1905 drought mm -hmm. and he wanted to know why. So he, he adventured the, the poles. He was a submariner. He was a pilot. He was a, right. um, yeah, just, a, just the most incredible. And uh, I've never heard of his name before. And um and uh, did he go to the poles with Mawson or someone? Yeah, um, Shackleton. Shackleton, that's right. Yeah, so he travelled with Shackleton. Um, I knew the name was familiar. Um, Bert Hinkler didn't have a plane, and um, he did. So he actually gave or sold his plane to Bert Hinkler, which became the Southern Cross. So his oh, story is intermeshed into so many, and he, he's the, he's the only um, World War One soldier to be awarded um, a gallant medal. Um, and he never carried a gun. He only carried a camera. <laughs> Good heavens. They're extraordinary. I'll look, I'll look out for him. I'll look yeah, out for the book. Amazing. Yep. Thanks. I see another hand raised there. So sorry if I cut somebody off. That's okay. Uh, David, your turn. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, uh, a book I once read that I quite like was uh, Paul Thoreau's um, The Happy Isles of Oceania. Um, which um, was in a canoe, but it was, um, he, he flew, so he sort of cheated. He flew to each place, but he, he travelled around in a, in a tiny canoe. But what I was really wanting to ask is that, um, uh, is, there a, is there plans, still plans? I, I remember on another, watching another interview with you that um, you, going on from the Black Sea, um, uh, might oh. be difficult at the moment, but um, going on to <laughs> Turkey and in a mirror dinghy again, are you still planning that? Well, that's sort of what I've been hinting at a little. So rather extraordinarily, um, I, for years I've been saying, well, years, years ago, back in 2009, I went to Venice and I, I actually uh, had some young students who were sort of family friends of mine and um, took them to Venice, which was great. And I remember standing there on the edge of the Great Lagoon and I could almost see in my mind's eye this little mirror dinghy coming across in the late afternoon light and mooring up amongst the gondolas. And I thought, ah, oh, do you know, it's not that far, really, sort of just across there is Croatia and down there is Greece and round there is sort of, you know, Istanbul and up the coast is, is um, the mouth of the Danube, Sulina. And so for years, I've been saying half jokingly or almost, you know, almost completely jokingly, oh, it'd be great to revive Jack de Crow and sail from where I left her round to um, Venice. Anyway, I finally, I'm, I'm turning 60 next year, and I finally thought, you know, if it's going to happen, I better do it. So <laughs> I was telling the, I was before on this interview, I was chatting to that young fella um, from Hobart, um, Dean, I think it was a Dean, and, and his mum, Holly. And um, I explained that I had this Romanian friend who might be able to find to see whether Jack de Croix was was still around. Well, he did his research and bless him and wrote to me to say, no, nah, gone. And at that point, I thought, well, silly idea anyway. Where would I get a mirror dinghy from? Blah, blah, blah. Now, There's here's the story. <laughs> well, 
Well, here's the extraordinary thing, is that literally two hours after I had read that message from my Romanian friend, a guy from England, complete stranger, a fellow called Steve, um, contacted me on Facebook and said something like, oh, are you the guy, are you the sand who wrote Jack to Crow? I hope you are. Um, loved your book. I'm writing to ask you a favour. I've just bought a bright yellow Miringi. I live on the Thames uh, just above London at a place called Benson, which I sailed past, I know it. Um, I've just bought a Miringi. I'm wondering if I could call it Jack the Crow in honour of your voyage. <laughs> and my first, my first reaction, because I'd had a few whiskies, was, oh, well, that's very kind of you and very flattered, but actually, I don't know, um, I'm thinking of reviving my voyage myself. Perhaps you could call it something similar, but not the same. But the next morning when I'd sobered up, I wrote to him and went, slightly bold request here, but here's my suggestion. Yes, you can call your boat Jack to Crow on this condition, but I come over to England next year, I buy it, rent it, borrow it, steal it, whatever, I go off and do my adventure in it. I give it back to you at the end. And therefore, you've got Jack de Crow with a, with a right to the name, as it were, a real, the real Jack de Crow with an adventure under its keel, honourable retirement on the Thames. And um, what do you reckon? And, and I, look, I added all sorts of things saying, look, I'm so sorry. This is probably completely out of the question. And how, how dare I? And also there's lots of other logistical things. How would I get at the Black Sea? I'd need to fit it out with oars. I'd need to fit it out with, you know, various things which will probably wreck it for you. So forget it, to be honest. Well, he wrote back to me the next morning going, brilliant idea. I so love that idea. In fact, forget about, don't worry about um, getting it to the Black Sea. I've got a trailer. I'll drive you there. We could go sailing together on the Black Sea. Um, meanwhile, it's got oars, and I'm already about to start fitting it out for marine sailing. And for the last, this is only about four weeks ago. <laughs> so for the last four weeks, this guy in England has been sending me videos and photos of everything he's doing to it. He's fitted it with an awning, which works much, much better than my awning, uh, because it's clipped under the boom instead of over the boom. And he is basically preparing this whole boat for me to go off and have an adventure. So, so having come that close to going, ah, silly. Yeah, what, what, are you, what are you thinking, Sandy, going in reverse or a different adventure? No, no, I'm going to sail it from there, from the Black Sea round to Venice. Um, ah. So I'm going to come down to Istanbul, just basically coastal sailing, mm round to Greece, wherever, I've already looked at maps, wherever there are islands close enough to see, you know, perhaps sail to by sight. Um, I'll see if I can zigzag around some of those Greek islands. There have been some fantastic documentaries recently on the Greek islands, which make it all look You, you can pretty easy, much island hop the G and all the way to Turkey um, from Greece. So, if you're coming down the, well, you came down the eastern side yeah. of the Aegean, the Turkish side, you could hop across via the islands to get to the, the Greek mainland. Well, exactly, exactly. So, yeah, and then round the bottom of Greece, up past Ithaca, Corfu, where I've I've been in the past and I love, and then up Croatia, where I've never been, but all mm, those Croatia will be fabulous. Uh, fantastic little islands all the way up to is it Spitz, Splits, I'm not sure, um, and then to Venice. So. What was just four weeks ago a complete daydream mm. um, has now, to the most in, in the most astonishing way, seems to be becoming a reality. So I've I've asked for time off from my school. They're happy to give me time off, um, uh, and I think I'm going to do it. So, um, and and what what I rather love is I I explained much earlier in this in this um, Zoom meeting that Jack the Crow the the crow the bird arrived in response to just a daydream a wish i wanted a crow mm. and two days later i had one well here was our sitting going i need a yellow miradingi called jack the crow where on earth can i get one and literally two hours later mm. um uh 
somebody from the other side of the world <laughs> says, I've got a mirror dinghy, which I want to call Jacques the Crow. What do you reckon? So anyway, it's all all a bit odd. Now there was a my, my sister there. calls that asking the universe. Well, yes, I know, and I I'm you ask sure the universe, I'm... and the universe provides. Yep. So there you go. I should ask for a Lamborghini, shouldn't I? But uh, I'm like not actually very interested in Lamborghinis. So it wouldn't um, work. <laughs> no. Anyway, and, and my publishers are uh, my pub. Yeah. So, Sandy, I have a little bit of homework for you. Between now and then, I strongly recommend you immerse yourself in uh, the history of the Ottoman Empire. Um, I've just finished uh, teaching this to some of my students. And uh, right. that, that um, route that you're planning on doing for this trip, you would find absolutely fascinating if you know some of the, the prehistory that, that goes on in that area with the Ottomans. And you're, you're going to say, sail through one of the areas where one of the most um, magnificent battles occurred. So I'll, I'll send you some details to it. So I'm not, <clears throat> no, so I'd, I'm love not I'd love that. I'm here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm also, um, I wonder whether many of you are familiar with Tim Severin. Um, mm. who, yeah, Tim Severin, magnificent. So he, he's a guy, for those of you who don't know, in the 70s, he um, set about well, well, he did various things. He he would build, for example, he wanted to investigate how true could the Odyssey have been, you know, the, the, the voyage of Odysseus in 3000 BC. And he thought, well, the best way of doing it is build a boat exactly as they would have had in 3000 BC, a type of Bronze Age galley, man it with the same number of men that um, Odysseus would have had, set off from Troy at the same time of the year, where the, uh, the, 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 the accounts say he set off and he recreated the voyage of Odysseus and, and found so many, you know, found himself going and bumping into places that were exactly as the Odyssey describes in the most extraordinary ways. He did another one up, up um, the Jason voyage up to the end of the Black Sea and later St. Brendan's voyage to America set off in a yes, horrible, amazing man, absolutely astonishing. And um, uh, and I'm just rereading at the moment his Odysseus voyage, which takes him all around the Med, um, but even down to North Africa, which I won't, <laughs> won't be attempting. Unless I, I, I think you may even have, have, have discovered the, the name for the book that you will inevitably write, Jack de Crow, The Odyssey. Well, absolutely, absolutely. And, and my um, a friend, my, well, my cousin, who's all on board, she said, and you should call it not Jack de Crow, D-E, but Jack de, D-E-U-X, Crow, which is sort of a nice little pun on um, Jack Jack de Crow too. So mm. who knows? Um, I think it would go over the heads of 99% of the population. Well, we, we didn't right. all study Latin. <laughs> <laughs> it's French. It's French. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, so look, and I might die in the attempt, but but um, may it may be that the gulfs will wash us down, as Tennyson says in in his poem. Um, Another thing that might be worth contemplating too, Sandy, in, in terms of in terms of um, meeting people along the way, the um, the the quote unquote sport or recreation, whatever you call it, of dinghy cruising is much more yeah. prevalent than it would have been 25 years ago. And I know, for example, yeah. there are some um, French and Italians who regularly do things like the, the Venice Lagoon and, and the Croatian islands and yada, 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 yada. Um, you could probably right. put some feelers out long beforehand and, and, and get in touch with some of these individuals and groups who could maybe join you for part of the, the, the Odyssey. It's a concept. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, yes. Nothing like local so, knowledge. I... <laughs> well, true, true, true. Um, yeah, Arsene, no, you, you must come with thanks us. Thanks. We have this great taverna in the next bay. <laughs> <laughs> now, I noticed there was a question that popped up, and I'm not very familiar with this old Battle of Lepanto. Yes, I know that. But there was a question that popped up from somebody called Peter Ironmonger, and and I was curious 
I didn't sort of respond to it. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. You, do you want to ask a question? He's muted. You can read his question out if you like. It says, how important for your adventure is it to do it alone? For your voyage to Venice, would you consider doing it together or with other boats? Oh, right. No, very good question. Um, the, br the brutal answer is, no, I don't want anybody else. Um, I, I, I don't mind occasionally you know, doing it like, like I can imagine half a day sailing along a stretch of coast with somebody who's sort of interested. Um, this, this lovely guy called um, Steve, the one who's preparing my boat for me at my bidding, which is crazy. You know, he, his first response was, oh, uh, we, could, we could do the whole thing together. And I, had, I, I was torn between um, politely saying, um, no. you really... Yeah, you know, you don't want me to. You, yeah, um, I think I need to do it alone, uh, only because I'm probably quite difficult to live with. Um, uh, but and 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 so on. Yeah, I like I like the idea of a solo a solo voyage with lots and lots of meets along the way, but not not um, uh, constrained by the needs of anybody else. I'm too selfish. I'm a bachelor. Confirmed mm. bachelor. Uh, yeah, which I, I know sounds a bit unfriendly, but no, that's, that would be but, the truth. <laughs> I guess you'd get to meet people that way instead of being in a group. Yeah. You'd be on mm. your own. You're more likely to have adventures meeting uh, people, I think. Yeah, like. Yeah. You, you, you're right. And you know, I, I learned a very valuable lesson. When I was 19, I set off to England. Um, just by plane, not in an adventurous way. I set off to give myself a gap year, long before gap years were invented. And right at the last minute, uh, a friend, a very dear friend, um, one year older than me, said, oh, I might come too. And I, my first reaction was, oh, fantastic. That'll be great. We'll travel together. And for six months, we did. We sort of traveled together and sort of got work in a, in a, in a, together. And I thought I loved it. And then after six months, he decided to go back to Australia. And I was devastated. I go, oh no, what am I gonna do? And you know, the moment he left, I, then I started really having fun. I mean, not, not fun in any sort of particular way, but then I actually felt that I was traveling and felt that I was having those adventures that I wanted. Because um, I found that when I was with somebody else, I was constantly, deferring to them, constantly sort of taking into account their needs. And as you say, um, because we always had each other to talk to, I was never meeting anybody else. And the moment I was solo, mm. I liked that that year suddenly became rich in all sorts of ways. So, and I've never forgotten that, that particular lesson, um, uh, especially when, when you're traveling. <clears throat> when I was in my early twenties, I traveled much of Australia and New Zealand by motorbike. Um, oh, some, back, some backpacking and some motorbiking and uh, years later I went on a, another trip with my girlfriend and uh, mm. it was nice to travel with her it was not anywhere near as rewarding simply because when I was traveling solo I was in camp kitchens and things like that and I was meeting other people yeah. and talking to them and finding about the locals and places to go and having conversations with people who I didn't know and meeting people Whereas, like you said, when I was traveling with um, someone I knew, um, I, yeah. was, I was not reaching out or, or, um, or talking with the locals or, or uh, you know, I guess finding out about those wonderful gems that you, that you find along the way, people and places. Yeah, yes. Uh, yes, absolutely. And it, it doesn't mean it doesn't get very lonely, but I, I've always found my... Uh, I very rarely get lonely because when I'm on my own, as long as I've got a pad of paper and a pen or a pencil, I'm always happy <laughs> because I'll be working out some math problem or doing some writing or sketching or, or something. And in fact, I, I found that if I go and sit in a bar or a pub somewhere and I'm just sitting there with a drink, nobody wants to talk to me because I'm 59 and, you know, not handsome anymore um but if i'm 
if I take with me a pad and I'm sitting doing some sort of problem or working out a, I don't know, inventing something, et cetera, ah, everybody wants to suddenly talk to me. Everybody wants to know what I'm doing. Everybody's interested or rather interesting people are really interested in what I'm doing. Um, and it's a fantastic way of meeting like-minded people. Um, so yeah, I'll be taking a pad of a pad of paper and a pencil with me. And look, I mean, you're the first people I've told this actually. I, I, all the, all you complete strangers. I mean, this is this is. Um, do you want us to still um, might not happen? Do you want but, us to meet, but, to meet your embargo that for you, Sandy, or is is that okay to say it again? Do you want us to embargo that for you, or is it okay to? Oh no, that's all right. That's all right. I, look, I'm, it's I'm so. Good. It's so close to definitely happening that I, I think we'll take this as a, yes, a launch. <laughs> so I guess what that leads to another question that um, you talk about using mm. notepads and things, and I guess that was a different era. These days, everyone's got hand phones and computers, and you probably have internet access almost everywhere. Um, You'll have to change? get a tracker. Would that change what you do, or you still do things with a pe pencil and paper? And you, you know, know that's technology? yeah, that's a really that's a very very good question, and that has exercised my mind a lot. It, 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 there's one part of me that wants wants to, at the commencement of this new adventure, to take my mobile phone and to drop it in a river somewhere, or or literally put it aside because it is, as we all know, I mean, they're marvellous, they're wonderful, they're so useful, but it's so distracting. You know, you're checking your emails every few minutes, you're checking your social media, checking this, checking that. And I'd like to, I'd like to think that I'm immune from that, but I'm not, you know. I will be constantly sort of checking it. And I would love, in fact, it would almost be a, a, a gimmick of the voyage and a gimmick of the new book um, is to go, well, this adventure was done without a mobile phone without a smartphone and without any of the resources that um that come with that and there's one part of me that's still hugely really really wants to do that mm. the other part of me is going look the only reason why this voyage is going to be possible is because on a phone you've got navigation apps you've got weather apps you've got um uh, all sorts of all sorts of really really useful tools, mm. and and I'm very much planning to do this whole thing, <laughs> you know, fair weather sailing. Uh, I will I will check to see when the storms are coming. I will hole up in some great, you know, harbour and stay for a week um, drinking ouzo uh, under the vine leaves and wait for the fine weather. And for that sort of thing, I I need an app. And and to be honest, today you want to even book into a guest house you probably actually need your smartphone you want to pay for anything you need your smartphone so i'm i'm really really torn between this whole idea of wanting to get rid of i don't i don't want to be constantly in email contact with my loved ones hmm. I, I like the idea of of contacting them by letter sent from a post office and by picking up a letter you know at, at the at the roads restaurant but, uh, but then again, you know, there are so many things that could be genuinely useful to me in terms of safely sailing along the coast. So I'm really torn, really torn. And I don't think I'm going to know the answer to that until I set off. What would be brilliant is if some clever technological friend of mine could say, here's a device, you can get X, Y, Z on this, which will help you, but I've blocked it so you can't get A, B, C on it. Um, so you can't be tempted to be you know, checking or, or you need dealing a child with child lock phone, things. basically. So. Uh, oh, what, sorry? A, ch a child lock phone for <laughs> yes, sailing, eight, sailing eight year olds, world, world, world traveling eight year olds, so they, they don't accidentally access the wrong thing. Yeah, well, and, and I know the technology exists to be able to make exactly that device <laughs> that I'm talking about. So, and I, I have so many clever friends, I'm sure they can do it. That was a very long um, response to a very short question. Sorry about that. Yeah, you, you could you could maybe do something like getting one of the very small sort of um, boat specific um, MPV 
screens with the the navigation tools on it, like a Garmin or a you know whatever. And um, yeah, and then because and, you know they've got those little portable power packs these days that take an hour to charge when it when you know once every three days when you've got access to a power a power outlet and leave the phone at home. Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. I mean, those, so those things that, have got GPS in them, and and, and you can download yeah. weather whenever you're in range of a satellite and yada yada yada. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe, so, maybe um, a Garmin inReach, one of those little things that can only do 160 texts, so you can send an, a, a nightly text to the to the loved ones to say, "I'm alive." <laughs> send. Yes. <laughs> That's well, all they need to I'm know. <laughs> yeah. No. Look, I I know the technology is out there, and it's just a matter of me investigating. As I say, this whole daydream has really just suddenly become a reality or a, a possibility in the last. Um, three or four weeks so it's all a bit new to me and I there's an awful lot I've still got to do too um and, and you know tr truly um Sandy the other option you know the, the the 180 degree option given that we're now 25 years apart if you like from journey one and journey two is to embrace the technology and use it to your advantage you know take well, yeah. GoPro and, and film you know the nice bits well you know my public to, to, yeah to, to the, to the web yeah. along the way. I know. And, and look, my publishers, who are fantastic, who are lovely. I um, love it. <laughs> well, they would. And they are already sort of saying, oh, look, you know, can you can you film bits and create a blog? And of course, I, I said to them at the time, said, oh, yes, of course, of course, because I, I always am obliging is my first response. But I later thought, no, no, no I, I don't want to do it. I, I, I... I, I certainly may take some footage and some film and et cetera, because it's so easy, mm -hmm. but I don't want to be doing it live. It's a live stream. I, I, oh, I, no, no, I no, no, no. That's horrible. You know what I, I, you're you're yeah, always three days or all. four days or five days behind. Like all these yeah. YouTubers who've got sailing channels and all that kind of stuff, some of them are two or three months behind real, yeah. real life. So what they're yes. showing on their on their channel is something that happened to them two months ago. Yeah, but there's a very strong temptation for me to go. No, for God's sake, it's going to be a, a leather bound paper diary, and I'm going to do watercolor illustrations, and that's it. <laughs> so, no, nothing more. I am not going to be a performing seal for anybody. Um, but who knows? But you know, we'll we'll see what happens. I never plan too far ahead or make too. I never make any decisions set in stone. It just doesn't work, does it? No. Especially when the weather and the, the wind and the waves have, have anything to do with your plans. That's true. That's true. Right. Well, it's, it sounds as though people are um, signing off, which is probably a good idea. I've probably got to go and have a bit of supper. Okay. Well, yeah, my stomach's grumbling. Your, thank you very much for your time. And um, certainly that was an excellent talk. And... I um, hope you do enjoy your, your trip when it packs up. Thank you. Thank you so much. And look, thank you for setting this up, Kim. Um, it's lovely. And I always, I always love chatting. Um, and uh, amazing, amazing technology. We can do this. Lovely to finally meet you, so to speak. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I just saw a message there. Somebody saying, where can they get the copy of the new edition? I just, look, I just think most bookshops, um, even if they don't have it in, they can order it. It's the, it's the newest one off the, off the rank. Black Ink is the publishers, um, and yeah, it's it's out there in the bookshops. So, so I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> um, yeah, great. Anyway, thank you so much, Kim, for organising, and thanks, thanks for everybody. See you, Sandy. See you. Cheers. See you all. Okay. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Kim. Good, Good luck, everyone. Happy sailing. Fair winds and following seas. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.